Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Back Chat. I'm Amy, this is my wife Maggie. Hello. Together we are Think a Thema. I'm all about the mechanics, Maggie's all about the theme. But in this series, we go through our top 10 most exciting crowdfunded campaigns mm-hmm. of the last fortnight. Yeah. Um, but before we get into that, well, we're trying to be much more fiscally responsible yes. this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Kickstarter seating is ramping up again. Yeah. We're just kind of going through... Ups and downs. Yeah, we have really like flows. Yeah, yeah, we're having really busy fortnights, and then we'll have like a we can only do a top five because there's just mm. not enough to talk about. So yeah. we'll see how the rest of the year pans out. Yeah. I think shipping, the shipping crisis is having um, yeah. lots of implications for people getting things that they've already purchased on time, but now also obviously publishers looking yeah. at what is the feasibility of, of doing a crowdfunded yeah. campaign. It's really hard to predict the way that um, shipping costs are yeah. going. Uh, so, understandably, things are getting a bit like hmm, we'll, we'll see yeah. but we're still enjoying looking at campaigns every fortnight one game that actually really stood out to me this fortnight that isn't in our top 10 is called batman the arkham asylum files mm. um now this is not our style of game not our mm. universe that we like to play no. in we're not really no. superhero yeah. kind of people yeah. enjoying that style of game um but What was stood out to me about this campaign is really interesting that it incorporates augmented reality. A lot of it, yeah. Yeah, you're kind of doing a bit of detective work. It had like vibes, um, like an escape room box detective game. You're kind of physically building like a 3D. uh, landscape, I guess, or the actual buildings, and then there's all the different components that okay, create the yeah the puzzles that you actually figure out with. But then you're actually also using your phone for a lot of that augmented reality, bringing elements to life and and yeah, immersing you in the story. Yeah, you know? and mm. I was thinking that we haven't seen a lot of that in board games yet. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like the technology has been around for a while, but it's a little bit clunky as to how to incorporate it. But yeah. I can imagine, you know, it would be perfect for like a dungeon crawler or something when you hold up the camera to the game mm. you can kind of see it come to life but yeah then there's always the how much do you incorporate tech like do you want people to be looking at a screen or yeah. do you want them to be looking at the table but we saw a really interesting example of it at yeah. gamma actually yeah which was um with trading cards i think it was trading collectible trading cards basketball cards yes i didn't actually because again we're also not very big on like sports but <laughs> in basketball what do we like what do we like uh yeah it, so i don't actually know if it was a game like an actual uh card game or just yeah collectible mm. cards but it was pretty cool because yeah you when you when they kind of showed the the phone and stuff in front of it the actual basketball player was kind of 3d coming alive and and doing the like shooting to the hoop thing yeah it looked really cool that looked really awesome yeah Yeah. so anyway interesting campaign go and check it out if that does interest you but i'm excited to see what's next in the integration of technology and board games but anyway now let's get into our top 10. Our number 10 is a game called Keedum's Dragons. Now, Keedum's Dragons is a re-implementation of a game called Keedum, which is apparently the first worker placement game. Now, this is by Richard Brees, who also did a lot of the key, designed the key series. So like Key Flower, uh, Key Flow, Keeper, which mm-hmm. ironically wasn't a Keeper for us, but you do love Key Flower. I do love Key Yeah, so, so in this game, this is a, a kind of re Retheming. This game has kind of gone through a couple of, of different uh, yeah, skins of theme. In this game, we're actually playing as different, uh, I would kind of say heroes, and we're going to be, uh, well, this is not just talking about Kedom, the town or the area. It's specifically about the dragons, because in this game, we're actually going to be able to go into different dragons' lairs to uh, gain different um, uh, treasures that, that we're eventually going to be able to exchange through a couple of different uh, ways. To, for more treasures so we can buy artifacts else because ultimately at the end of the game whoever has the most artifacts wins now the way the actual game plays is you have access to, to you have your own set of uh, workers all of different values that are going to be placed face down in the different areas of the of the game board so you've got all the dragons uh, layers at the bottom or you could go into the the kind of the town area where you have the market where you're going to be able to exchange some of those treasures or multiply them from more treasures or all the different kinds of treasures uh, you're going to be able to get spells that will give you different uh, unique abilities or a, a ways to kind of break the game a little bit or, or mitigate risk in different areas and then ultimately where you want to end up is inside the the kingdom 
where you're going to be able to exchange some of these, these treasures for those very powerful artifacts, which are the ones that you're collecting for the end. Not only that, those artifacts actually will give you different powers throughout the game that you can kind of activate to, again, give you a bit of an advantage. The cool thing with that is that in order to be able to kind of get past the gate, you also will have a little um, the guard at the gate that you're going to have to be able to uh, bribe or kind of bully your way or, or yeah, overpower your way. So in, in and the way that you're going to be playing is you're going to be, again, secretly putting face down where your workers are going to be placed. They're, they'll be revealed uh, area by area, whoever has the most powerful worker, and you can actually end up having two workers to kind of add up your power, will win that area. In the dragon's area, it's pretty varied because you can actually, um, you can, depending on the number of players, you can end up winning first and second place. Some of the other um, placement areas, it's just whoever has the highest that will gain the ability of that of that location. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think as worker placement has evolved, there's, or as gaming has evolved, there's been a reduction probably in the amount of uh, trying to make people feel good about every move that they're making. And so in a lot of games, you see a lot of consolation prizes. Yeah. If something happened and yeah. you're like, oh, I missed out. Oh, but at least I get these two resources or something like that. Yeah. Whereas this is like a much earlier game and it feels a bit more punishing. Yeah, there are areas where you can end up with nothing. Yeah, you, so you like, go there oh, and then all, of, my workers there. Yeah. all of the workers are revealed and then you're like, oh, like I didn't yeah. win that battle. And yeah, so I, yeah. I come home with nothing, which yeah. is interesting that that has evolved through over over time in the mm, hobby yeah yeah the other thing is when uh, and when you go to the actual getting the artifacts a uh, bit that's where yes you're going to be you're going to win it by going the highest but the higher you go that's the price that you have to pay for that artifact in the form of uh, treasures of the same type which can be really tricky to get so that's where I think it becomes really really interesting that mm. push and pull of like oh do I really try and win it but then also do I have enough to pay for for that resource because then it might end up being that I overcommitted and then by the time you know where there i i actually can't purchase it and amy had put just one you know level one or level two worker there and then she kind of gets it gets to snap it up for a bargain mm. yeah so i think ultimately for me it's a i actually quite like the look of it like I, i'm quite attracted to the to the artwork and um it's I very can, in line with the key series yeah exactly yeah. and i yeah. you know i don't mind the theme and uh, so so it's I, I like it. I think the main thing with this is it just seems pretty light and do yeah. not enjoy the, the concept of being able to end up with nothing mm. if, if I kind of... Yeah, yeah it seems like area. also because of the way it works, it would be a much better game at a higher player yeah. count. I just, I'm not sure that it has a role in our gaming collection. We have a lot of that kind of mid-weight yeah. worker placement. Um, I do like the key series. Um, however, they do tend to be a little bit hit and miss for me personally. Mm. Um, but I will say that they are often quite hard to find yeah. after the fact. And so, of course, if you're a fan of the series, go and check that out. Um, but if you live in rest of world for postage, you're in a lot oh. of trouble because oh. I believe it's about 50 pound mm. um, delivered uh, anywhere else, including Australia. So mm. we won't be back in this one but uh yeah go and check this out if you're into that series and that is our number na- uh, number, number 10, 10. Yeah. Ooh, getting ahead of myself Keedum's dragons. Keedum dragons and our actual number nine is a little game called ukiyo now ukiyo is a game that was uh published prior but it started as a print and play i believe mm. and then they printed it once in physical edition mm. and now this is the reprint of the game and this is one of those little tuck box 18 card games um, where you're going to be puzzling out to try and achieve a number of objectives in a multiplayer game well actually the, the underlying mechanic is that kind of card um, melding kind of mechanic mm. where you're um, trying to place them on top of each other in a way that creates patterns. Um, a very fast, quick game. Uh, when you're playing multiplayer, you're going to be trying to achieve the objective that is on the last card in your hand. Um, whereas when it's a solo experience, you're going to be trying to achieve a number of ob- objectives um, by playing out the entire puzzle. So in multiplayer, you're contributing to the same puzzle, mm. not have it, not playing your own puzzle. Yeah. Um, which is different to a game like Orchard, Mm -hmm. which is kind of that similar style of overlaying the puzzle. Um, But what's interesting is uh, when we looked through this, I think this game actually does shine for solo play. Mm. And all of the reviews, if you look at um, the reviews, a lot of the people who are very fond of this game are playing it solo because it's one of those games that you can take anywhere with you and just try and puzzle puzzle it out. Mm. And the different combinations of the objectives Mm. create um, a different experience for you. Mm. So 
Um, not much to this game, but yeah. I did want to feature it because um, a lot of people were waiting for this to be reprinted. So mm -hmm. it's not very expensive either. It's about seven pounds, I believe, which is $13. You'll need to double that to get it shipped to Australia. Alternatively, they still do offer um, this game and other games in print and play as well. Mm -hmm. So you can go and check yeah. that out and do that. We haven't quite gotten into the print and play games yet. We just never print them. Well, we just so, have... Yeah, I that's don't like find a, we have time. It's one more barrier. It is such to, an yeah. essential component of a print and play. Is you have the to printing. print them before the printing. you can play them. We're much and better at... we never get around to... We, we got We're much better. We've got the other... We've got the play nailed. Yeah. But the printing, not so much. Because it's... We've got all those setups where we don't actually have our printer out, usually. So mm. it's like you kind of have to go into a cupboard, dig it out. It's also not a very good plug printer. Plug it into... <clears throat> yeah, yeah a lot so, of people pay to get them printed. There's a lot of friction, let's there's say. Like, there's a lot, lot of barriers things working to, against yeah, us. Yeah. Um, but I think with this one for me, it's more that it's just, it's quite abstract. And I yeah. feel like I, even though I've been intrigued by this type of puzzle in the past, I know that I personally just get tired of them very quickly because it's sort of, yeah, that abstract kind of just, oh, you know, did I, did I manage to get all these uh, icons in a row and whatnot? <clears throat> that becomes really, like, it gets really old for me very quickly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There isn't really a lot of, yeah, obviously there's not a lot of theme to, like, you know, immerse yourself into. And so that's why it wouldn't really be one for me. Yeah, I think, and for me, of course, I like a multiplayer game. I like less the idea of building on on the same puzzle together. Mm. Um, and also it does feel like them because you want to be the person, you want to achieve the objective that is left in your hand on the card mm. left in your hand. There's a last player. It feels like there'd be a last player advantage by being the last person to manipulate the game state. You've got more chance of kind of making that final move to stop someone else getting what you, what you think their pattern might be um, mm. and creating your pattern instead. So disrupting the game state at the very last moment. Mm. Um, so, so for me, it's not a probably not a multiplayer game. I'd probably sit down and play it solo. I don't mind if it, a solo game is extremely fast mm. and it has a puzzle element. I don't mind abstract. And if Maggie's watching, even better, so I can show off my <laughs> my crafty skills and beat her. The score. only time you play solo is when I'm there to watch. Yeah, you and when play. I can make it competitive, like we're trying to beat each other's score or something in a very short. It's that time whole thing frame. of like, mom, mom, look at me, look at me, do this, like just do your thing. Like, why do you have yeah, to have an audience for it to be external valid? validation? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's not go into that. That's a whole other video. Um, but that is our number nine ukiyo. And number eight is a game called Castleshire, in which we are playing as different builders trying to uh, create the build the perfect castle. And so it's a it's a bit of a game of uh, of bluffing and a little bit of memory. Are we trying to show off to the Majesty? Well, I yes, think it's like we're yes. trying to be the well, best master builder. Yeah, but you, you're allowed to be a bit shady. You know, yeah. you're allowed to kind of build things where they're not really meant to, as long as you don't get caught, mm -hmm. which is where the bluffing element comes in. So in this game, what's going to be happening is um, we all start with a, a set of cards, which are the different uh, chambers that we're going to be able to build uh, along these, uh, I believe it's three different columns of, of the castle. And um, the castle is all numbered so from 1 through to 12 from memory and so these uh, the the chamber should be built in their correct place what happens though is that when we when we start the game we do a tender process which is kind of deciding okay well what's going to be the first um, the first level that we're going to be building from for this round and once that's sort of decided that becomes sort of like the first the first spot and then one by one we're going to be deciding okay well face down I'm going to now build say for example if the the first level ended up being five um, then I'm going to say oh maybe I'm going to go to seven and put a face down card on seven and put my little worker there my little meeple were um, a builder there Amy can then say yeah I think uh, Maggie's pretty uh, pretty honest I think she's actually going to be building oh, a seven on seven or is she gonna go no I think you're trying to to get away with like a two or a one um, in that in that seven so she can contest it if she contests it and I show and I actually was saying telling the truth and there was a seven on seven I get to put an extra I get to kick her out because you would put a little meeple to kind of come here and like contest I don't think you're doing the right thing I get to kick her meeple out and I get to put an extra one of my builder uh, meeples in there this is important because of the when we finish that round is whoever ends up having all the meeples that you end up leaving on that board become your points. Mm -hmm. That as well as whoever managed to build the highest valid level for that yes. for that round. And in a multiplayer game, you get to allow other people to come in and contest as well. Mm -hmm. And if everyone else believes mm -hmm. that Maggie looks a little bit shady um, and Maggie is not 
typically a great liar. I'm not a good bluffer. Uh, yeah. Not a good bluffer. I don't have a good poker face, apparently. <laughs> no. But I think you're actually getting Just better at it. I think you're yeah. getting better at it. I think you're getting better at throwing me off with like purposeful, you're not, shady you looks. You know why? Because I, I just have to get we've into been married a, for a long time. Yeah, and no. I have to get into a mindset of like, I have to believe that I am telling the truth and mm-hmm. then it kind of comes across as if I'm, yeah. So I have to fool myself first. <laughs> that's the biggest uh, challenge to then convincingly be able to, yes. that's a lot of work. I, it's not my, <laughs> that's why bluffing games don't tend to be high on my uh, list of list yeah. of games. But let me finish the, yeah, mm-hmm. where I was going. So, so if Amy were to be right, however, mm-hmm. then she gets to kick off my meeple and they go into this sort of resting area, meaning that I can't actually use them for the rest of, of this round. And then she gets to kind of have her meeple there. So she's starts to claim stuff that wasn't even you know her own cards Mm -hmm. so the the rounds themselves can play very very quickly uh and then it's yeah you're just kind of adding up all the all the uh, the meeples that you ended up having on the on the board so you're trying to like manage your hand of cards as well interestingly though when when that round ends those meeples are on the board going to that kind of resting phase which means for the next round you don't have them available so there's this constant kind of balance of going oh you know some some rounds i'm actually going to be really uh short on uh work or on builders which means that you're going to be less able to to contest other mm-hmm. people as well or mm-hmm. to do your own building they've got a couple of other like they've got um things like allies as well which are cards that you can gain as a as a catch-up mechanic that give you uh, yeah. one-off abilities mm-hmm. or unique uh, or, or sort of just unique powers that you can mm-hmm. use. Yeah, um, I was going to say that actually the um, the going to rest, I think, I believe is like the advanced variant. Okay, but, yeah. But if, what I think this game would be good for is probably family households. I feel mm-hmm. like it has got that nice, like very easy mechanic, mm-hmm. but it still has that board presence. It's yeah. kind of a fun theme that you're building up these castles. You can um, also get the deluxe edition, which has like a proper mat and everything yeah, that, like that cloth, rolls out, um, like a thin yeah. cloth mat. Yeah. Um, um, but you can add in then expansions kind of like mm. in a Carcassonne-esque way mm. yeah. where um, you're just adding in one more element or uh, one little thing to contend with or yeah, yeah. player abilities and that type of thing. So it's yeah. definitely been designed to be very stripped back at its core, a very mm. easy concept. I also really like the box <laughs> mm. because it comes in um, like a book shaped box. Mm-hmm. And so when you open it, it looks like a book and it's, yeah. it's really cute. And this game is coming out of New Zealand yeah. too. So it's exciting to see um, a Kiwi publisher. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So ultimately, I think with this game is more that matter that it is quite a light one. Mm-hmm. And so I, yeah, I would struggle to find like what are the best occasions to mm. bring this out on the table, which is probably why I wouldn't be backing yeah, it myself. Yeah, a bit simple for yeah. our household. But if yeah. you've got kids at home or you're looking for a more lightweight, yeah. but bigger box game, go yeah. and check out Castle Shire, our number eight. And number seven is one for all the thinkers out there, because this one is on our list driven purely by the interesting mechanics. This is 44 BCE, which is set in the aftermath of uh, when Caesar was... Julius Caesar was assassinated. Assassinated, yeah. and now it's the struggle of power. We've mm. seen that theme before in many games. Um, but in this one, the mechanics are one versus many, which... Um, not a new thing we've seen that before but interestingly this one shifts depending on who has power from round to mm. round so the one versus many is going to be changing and that dynamic of working together versus one other player is going to change from round to round which i think is really really interesting as an idea now the way that this game works is in a very euro-esque style way where you will be trying to um, build buildings in one part of the board you're going to be trying to get influence and then you're going to be using that influence to enlist um, workers or help in the form of cards and those cards are going to become your hand which then when we get to the battle of one versus many what's going to happen is we're going to have hidden player screens and we're going to be able to allocate um, those um, cards down on your player board to win a battle across three fields. And in these three fields, we're going to be comparing the group's um, majority with influence and characters versus the Imperium Myers's um, power in each of those fields. And the idea is that you're trying to overthrow the leader um, so that you can gain power and become um, the next person fighting against the many. Um, so that is a really interesting thought for Mm. a game um, because I 
while you know we don't really have a lot of one versus many games but mm. i don't really like the idea of one person being alone for the entire game mm-hmm. just being like okay well everyone's going to be versus me for the entire mm. game um the other thing i like about this game is actually only one person wins ultimately so in each of these battles uh regardless of whether you're the one or the many you're going to be collecting um different levels of points to t- um based on how much you're contributing to each of those mm. um battles if you like and so um you can still have one winner mm. which is very different in a one versus many yeah, game yeah. um and so yeah i just i don't know i really liked the idea of that what's holding me back from backing it is um the way that the game plays out is you have a little marker that tracks what stage of the game you're at. And there are nine stages in this game. Mm-hmm. And I have a bit of a mixed relationship with games that have like a stage. Okay, next mm-hmm. stage, now we do this. Okay, next stage, now we do this. I mm-hmm. feel like it can be um, disruptive to the flow of the game. So, mm-hmm. and especially when there's like hidden screens uh, in combination mm-hmm. with that, I feel like for me, it wouldn't like flow as nicely yeah. as I'd want it to. Mm-hmm. But I really, I would like to play this game just because I, f- I think it's really interesting mm. in the way that it's been designed. I find it very confronting whenever there's like a one versus many. I both, because I both don't enjoy being the one nor the many that are like <laughs> chasing the one. And so it's one that like, I, I, yeah, it's just not my style of game, which is why it's probably scoring fairly low for me. Again, not a reflection of the game. It's more just like, yeah preferences yeah the pledge levels are quite interesting in this game because the base level game is only $59 which is not too bad Mm. but then it jumps right up to $109 for minis and coins um so almost twice the price Mm. um but the minis are not that like they're not a huge part of the game they're just Mm. going to be your kind of leader characters on the scoring track um and then coins mm. uh, for me are not worth another fifty dollars so mm. i don't know about the the cost i'd be going in if you are interested in it i'd probably be going in at that lower cost um level but if you are interested go and check that out that is our number seven 44 bce and number six is a game called drags to riches which is another drag queen themed game mm-hmm. we had one i believe in the yeah, previous episode or a couple of uh, weeks ago um so in this this is actually going to be a deck building game i love the theme uh, and i love deck building so in this game we're all playing as uh you get your own character of your own uh, drag queen and then you're going to be essentially in a deck building type of way using the cards that you have to purchase other cards which are going to be contributing towards your look that you're eventually going to be revealing and hoping to you know outlook uh every every other queen uh on display so so this is one of those games where uh, again a lot of the mechanics feel very uh, familiar in terms of like it feels fairly straightforward and simple there isn't really a i couldn't find um a link to the rule book or and there aren't really any playthroughs so it's really difficult to kind of get a sense for uh, any complexities beyond just the basic you know I, I, you do get a sense that there's a vote of whether or not you're ready to reveal your look. Yeah, but the reason why that's interesting is mm. because you've got to know when to hold them and when to actually mm-hmm. reveal your yeah. look because each round there's a number of victory points up for grabs yeah, and that's going event. to be yeah, mm-hmm. and that's going to be changing from round to mm. round. And so if you decide to reveal your look and everyone gets an opportunity to reveal, only the person who has the the highest combination of points mm. for their look is going to score that card. So mm. then the tension becomes do I score or now and try and get all the lower value events mm-hmm. um, that no one is going to want to go for or maybe everybody else is thinking mm, that yeah and so maybe i should actually go for the highest card yeah. that no one you know everyone's anyway yeah. so it's just one of those trying to pick what your opponents are going to do mm. um i thought that was actually really quite interesting mm-hmm. as a mechanic um it's not a difficult game you're also going to be drafting cards in the market using coin values that are on the cards that yeah. you already have so that kind of deck building element is built in there um there's also mention of you can kind of you can loan cards to other players and mm-hmm. I, I didn't really get a good sense of like how why and how you would do that and what would be the advantages of that gameplay wise mm-hmm. So this is why I feel like there are some yeah there's some yeah. gaps for me in terms of like how does he actually play like how does it actually feel like what are the those um those details yeah I would I mean out? I would have liked to see some more videos on the gameplay but I mm. did enjoy the videos of the drag queens yeah. bag of chips and Latrice Royale yeah. um spruiking the game it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so that was great I also really love that this game comes with when you back this game you get a booklet about the history of drag mm-hmm. I think that's really important mm-hmm. um obviously they had a lot of um, consultants working on this 
game as well. And there's going to be a Drag King expansion, which mm. is really cool. Yeah. Um, this game is $37 US um, if you're looking to get it. It's coming, it's being published in the UK. Unfortunately, um, because it's being published out of the UK, the shipping costs to Australia mm. are quite expensive. Um, th- 33 pound, I mm. believe, like very expensive. Yeah. And so that's going to come down drastically if they get enough backers of this game. I'm kind of on the fence about this game. Mm-hmm. I really yeah. want to support projects like this. I really, we love the theme. Our friends. I love the artwork too. Like, yeah, I think the they've done a great, great job with all yeah. the aesthetics of the game. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I really like the look of this one. Um, but we're just holding off to see if we can, you know, see how many Australian backers they can get mm. or what, what is revealed throughout the mm. campaign. Yeah. Um, but that is our number six. Drags to Riches. Uh, number five is a game called The Gig, and this game is a roll and write game about being in a jazz band. Love and adore the theme. Well, you don't <laughs> see it very often, um, but what else is interesting about this game mechanically is that it is a real time roll and write, and I still don't own a real time roll and write, mm. even though I've always been intrigued to play one. The way that this game works is you have a shared song sheet that is on a book that's on the center of the table, and everybody's going to be um, rolling their dice all at once, and then there's a bit of a race element in that you're going to be able to complete a solo if you're a ma- um, magician, a musician, or if you're a magician, musician with your uh, with your instrument. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're going to be able to race the other players to put these dice out and to gain some big solo points. But if you're a bit slower than that, you're able to then use the dice that other people have placed to harmonize and to also get points, um, you know, by utilizing what's been placed Mm -hmm. on the board, Um, which I really like because some people don't like the idea of real time. They don't like the idea of racing and missing out on something. Mm. And so that's a really nice way to also reward players um, who didn't get the opportunity to do that solo. Um, But what's interesting is the way that you place out your dice um, on that shared sheet is going to provide you with a shape um, kind of like a polyomino shape Mm -hmm. that you're then going to be placing down onto your own player sheet which has your instrument Mm -hmm. on it and all of the individual instruments are going to score points in slightly different ways Um, I believe there's eight in um, the base game Mm -hmm. Um, and so I don't know it just looks like a really fun kind of light experience Mm -hmm. I don't think it looks very complicated but I love the artwork I think that yeah. it's very true to the genre yeah. um, and they've obviously done a lot of work to make it feel really thematic. Mm, yeah. um, you can just imagine playing this and having some jazz on in the background. I just <laughs> yeah. think it would be really cool. It's, yeah. a, it's a really cool theme. Yeah, I like all the yeah the variations of it and the whole like, you know, when you have that that activity, the way to stop it is you, you someone like yells, take it to the bridge. So it's like that's the so so I, I enjoy all those kind of uh, little little elements. And yeah, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, the puzzle that then you bring on to your own individual instrument and because all the instruments have different shapes they've become their unique puzzles in a yeah. way this yeah. is a game that i could see you me and my sister playing and my mm. sister and i racing each other to try and <laughs> achieve something and you you would just be casually like oh okay now i'm going to change my dice to this using this power and mm. now i'm going to that's going to enable me to do this and you would that absolutely over here and that yeah part. you would absolutely win every yeah. time uh because i would just be lured in by mm. oh it's kind of like when we play wonderland's war and we're focused on the battle and you're yeah. just like objective quest Quite- a quest, 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 because oh, I won. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think there's something for everyone in this game, mm. um, and it really intrigues me. Now, it's interesting because they have two versions of the game. Mm. Um, there is one that has Kickstarter exclusives and one that doesn't. And what's interesting is most people are backing it at the base level game, mm. um, and I believe that's because of the price differential. So I think it's about twenty nine US dollars for the base game, which is kind of what you would expect to play mm. for a roll and write. Yeah, um, but then. And if you jump up to that next level, it's 43 US mm. dollars, um, which pushes it into a bit more of expensive space. You do get, I believe, um, some special cards, but also they are going to have three new playable instruments. So the player mm. boards, those are being voted on um, by backers and mm. by people engaged with the campaign. Yep. So you can get involved that way. But maybe people are waiting to upgrade their pledge mm. um, to find out what those extra instruments are. I saw that they were talking about a harmonica. I thought that was a pretty cool additional in- instruments yeah. and someone said cowbell um it's actually, cowbell. actually there's needs a lot of people cowbell. saying cowbell in the comments so maybe yeah. that will be a thing as well <laughs> um but that is our number five go and check that out that is the roll and write 
the gig which we are backing. Our number four is a game called Bark Avenue. And in Bark Avenue, we are playing as dog walkers, trying to have the most fame and the most make the most money in the very, very competitive uh, dog walking scene of New York City. And so this game is actually going to be a route optimization and also a pick up and deliver. Because what are the things that we're gonna be doing? We're gonna be going collecting um, some of these doggies, uh, cute, cute puppies, cute, beautiful cards of, of, of doggies, taking them out on walks and making sure that obviously they all have their preference of uh, length of walk, uh, also their preferred spots and, you know, the kind of tr the treats and stuff. And so obviously we want very, very happy pups so that then we get the best reviews and get some uh, more repeat business, essentially. So mechanically, the way this game plays out is you've got a, dr a grid of New York City where you're going to be, uh, yeah, essentially rolling dice to figure out which ways, you, which neighborhoods you're going to go into. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to be moving only as fast as your slowest dog. Yeah, I like that as a mechanic, yeah. which is very thematic it's as super well. super thematic, yeah. But I like that idea that you can only have a certain number of dogs mm -hmm. and that if you've got a slow dog where you've got to wait until you've dropped off that dog yeah. to get a new dog you and hopefully move a, a bit faster. You can't rush yeah. a slow puppy. Uh, I love aesthetically like the the doggies, like the cards of the dogs. I believe that in one of the pledge levels you can get your own dog uh, immortalized in board game format and from the form of a card as well. Uh, I really like those illustrations. They've got, um, you get points as well for collecting poop, which is what you should be doing. Like you should, you can't just be leaving yeah, responsible dog mm -hmm. ownership and dog walkership mm -hmm. i guess um but yeah they've got this little uh squishy poop tokens yeah that, that's a kickstarter exclusive is the squishy poop tokens <laughs> yeah, which, which are very cute yeah which are very cute yes. so i think yeah aesthetically like i love love the theme uh it sounds like there's a lot of very thematic elements in it uh, ultimately pick up and deliver is just one of those mechanics that we're not really yeah, big on. Yeah, it works for us in only certain occasions. In this mm. case, I feel like it might be a little too light for us. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, so ultimately it's probably not one for us in our collection, but if you are interested and you love the theme, go and check that out. It's quite reasonably priced at $49 US for the game. However, shipping to Australia is currently listed as unknown, yeah. um, which is a bit terrifying <laughs> if you've been copying some, some of the shipping increases mm. recently. Mm. Um, so so keep an eye on that and see what happens. That is our number four, Bark Avenue. Our number three is a game called Bananya. Now, Bananya is about a cat-banana hybrid. Mm. And if you watch the channel, you'll know that I have a strange thing for hybrids. Yeah. I really like Weakness. my lemon fish that sits on our mm -hmm. windowsill um, that I shared a photo of on Instagram because we were talking about it. It's very, very cute. Um, and this game is based on a Japanese anime of the same title, Bananya. Um, Bananya is a cat that looks like it's inside a banana peel mm -hmm. but when it moves around it can't get out of the banana peel it just is and mm -hmm. it dreams of being a chocolate coated banana because I mean, chocolate coated dream big <laughs> yeah, he, he always has wanted to be a chocolate coated banana banana because that is what he perceives to be the best um, mm -hmm. because he has a very sweet tooth. Now, mm. I actually went back and watched a few of the anime episodes on YouTube, which um, are very amusing and mm. very, very cute. But in this game, um, you are going to be trying to collect all of the Bananya buddies or mm. characters. So ultimately in this game, you are trying to do set collection and you are trying to get one of each of the 10 characters in your hand. If you can do that, then you're going to win the game. And the way that it plays out, of course, is that you will be um, discarding cards into the box, which is a kitty litter mm. box, which is really cute. That sits mm -hmm. in the middle of the table. And then you're going to be able to draft new cards either from from the draw deck or from out of that kitty litter box mm. um, but of course all of the cards also have powers as well so as you're playing them it's going to disrupt the game things like you know handing over your hand of cards or being able to steal cards from each other mm. so one of those really kind of light party style games mm. it reminds me a little bit of muffin time yeah. um, which is a game that um, is just absolutely chaotic yeah. it's probably broken in many ways it's definitely not balanced but our <laughs> friends love it um, and our friends also really love cute games mm -hmm. uh, we've got quite a lot of people in our lives that just collect anything that's like super cute yeah, so yeah. I'm thinking of those mushroom cat um the mushroom cats so yeah. now we've got banana cats mm -hmm. um this is a game that I will be backing because it's actually really cheap as well so it's $15 uh with cheap postage uh for the base game 
Um, but do note that the base game should be available in retail as is. Um, if you pay $25, you get a deluxe edition with a different box and a um, an expansion, and that is not going to be available at retail. So mm. often people who like to collect these style of games do like to get the Kickstarter edition. Mm. Um, then you can go all in where they have enamel pins of the little banana, super which cute. is super cute. <laughs> um, and there's a whole range of different expansion packs, or mm. you can add those individually for $5. So mm. I haven't quite worked out what my mix of things are going to be. I know that I'm probably going to get multiple copies of it because I can just think of the exact people in our lives yeah. that will love this and then want to find a copy. Like for easy presents that you know will delight exactly. the recipient. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if this interests you, go and check it out. Uh, number three, a very light game, Bananya. Our number two is a game called Arcs. Now this is a game by Cole Worley and published by Leader Games. So this is the team that brought the, uh, brought us Oath, that brought us Root. So, you know, hi, for good reason. There's a lot of expectations, a lot of eyeballs. And it is what, doing very well. It is doing yeah. Yeah, exceedingly well. We yes. actually did cover a preview of this game. So I'll give you a little bit, we'll, we'll link to that as well if you want to see sort of uh, more full details of what we thought and, and things like that. But in ARCs, we are finding ourselves in the, de- the last days of a decaying empire. And in space, we're different factions, which we all start very symmetrically. We all start with the same sort of um, number of units and conditions. And obviously there's a vacuum of power that we are going to make sure that we fill where the next where the next uh, faction to to rule uh, and control the galaxy so ultimately we really just want to get the most uh, power um, by the end of the game now th- this is interesting because you can either play it as a one game or the space opera that is the intention of this which is as a campaign that gets played out over uh, i believe three games and so if you're doing it over three games, your your uh, obviously it's a longer experience, but your factions are going to become gradually more asymmetric um, over time. They're evolving over time, and the board's bigger as well. The board for the is bigger, yeah. yeah. So it is, yeah. It's a it's a much more epic uh, experience. Interestingly, though, in terms of the game, the whole idea of this game is that the the uh, rules overhead is actually fairly low, so it's pretty easy to learn and get into it. I've buried the lead here. It's actually a trick taking lead um, sort of action mechanic. So overall, you've got this, you know, you've got the the space of of, uh, the galaxy, essentially, you've got all these different planets. We're going to be uh, going around exploring, Mm -hmm. uh, trying to build our buildings, create our um, our, our sort of presence in different systems, also potentially battling one another, getting resources to do all sorts of different things, developing technology so that it allows us to do uh, more uh, complicated or put out uh, more more complex uh, buildings or units as well. Um, but ultimately, the, all the, the way that we're going to be doing all of that is through a, th- a, a, a core trick-taking mechanic. So what trick-taking really means is we are going to have cards that determine the types of actions that we can do. So be it, you know, aggression or movement or building. And so those cards have different numbers on them. So the suit is the type of action and then the number um, determines. So the lower numbers will usually have more, uh, more actions that you can take for that car. So for example, a one my, my, a one for movement, um, and I'm going to be thinking this off the top of my head, might allow me to do five movements with that card. The movement card that is uh, a level four, for example, might only allow me to do it twice or once. And so the, the lower card that I play, then the more of that action I'll usually be able to do. And that's based on how many um, times the icon is uh, illustrated on the card. But when, when, I, when I lead, if I have the initiative, I lead with that, everyone around the table will get to, again, either follow me and play the same uh, type of action and I, either ideally go higher, meaning they're going to now take the initiative or get to determine or be the first player um, mm-hmm. in the next round. Mm-hmm. Or if they don't want to follow or they can't follow, they don't have to, they can play a different type of action, but then they can only play no matter what number they, they play, they can only do that action once. Yeah. So the tension is always in winning tricks or taking mm. more actions. Um, it's a really interesting combination of mechanics, um, as you would expect from mm. this design team. Yeah. Um, but I do want to address some of the questions that were that were asked of us mm-hmm. after we did the preview. So go and check out the preview. Um, but in terms of what came up in the comments, a lot of people were asking about comparison between this and Brian Baru. So I just want mm. to address that. Um, this, because it has the action selection built into the trick taking, 
thinking. It's far more complex in the way that you need to think about which card to play. So mm. in Brian Brew, um, you are definitely using levers to go up different tracks and to get things done. Um, but it's not as complex a decision. Really, you're just trying as much yeah. as possible to compete for the lead in Brian Brew. In this one, you really don't know if you want the lead because sometimes you have a really bad hand and you're going to have to try and copy mm. someone else's action, which means there's a whole other layer about thinking about the timing of having the lead and what you need to get done in the game. Yeah, it does lead to a little bit of AP. I mentioned mm -hmm. in um, the preview that this game does feel a little bit long sometimes. And that's because players turns um, are usually determined by what's played as the lead trick. And mm -hmm. so that creates a bit of thinking time around, okay, now this is the lead. Do I want to go in on this? Yeah. Like, do I want to copy? And so you have to rethink your turn a little bit at the start. But other people have also asked us about it, compar comparing it to Oath. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that this has such, a lower rules overhead. Yeah. We Much learned this to get into. Yeah, yeah, we learned this very quickly. Maggie taught me extremely quickly after she'd read the rule book. Um, and so you're going to be able to get it to the table much easier yeah. with more people. Mm -hmm. um, and that is really important because ultimately Oath was a game that uh, we really enjoyed experiencing, but mm. getting it back to the table is going to be quite difficult, yeah. even though I've kept it for collection purposes. Yes. Um, but for me, this would probably sit somewhere between Pax Premier and Oath. So somewhere in the middle for me mm. um, because of space. Um, so my my slightly lower rating is just because it's set in space and oh, because yeah. Cole Worley designs um, in the case of um, Oath and in this, that's really going to reward playing it multiple times. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so this is the campaign style of game or getting to know the, the game really intricately well in terms of mm. how you um, upgrade your technologies and things so that you can get out mm. and get more done. That is going to reward skilled players. And we tend not to play games like that, like just play the yeah. same game over and over and over. We tend to be more like variety seeking and playing yeah, yeah. lots of different games from our shelf. So mm. um, for, for that reason, it's probably, yeah, probably lower for me than PAX, which yeah. is more of a one-off kind of experience for me. Um, and then I'll also say that in the game, I mentioned the the movement, and that is actually taken from Root. So if you mm -hmm. enjoy Root, the movement um, mechanic is in there about not being able to move out of a system. Yeah, until you need to have majority either where you're leaving from or where you're yeah. arriving. Which yeah. I really, I really enjoyed that mm. in this game. But ultimately, the trick taking element is just so intriguing in this game. Mm. And had I not played the preview already, this would be just a blind back for me. I mm -hmm. always. Yeah always appreciate what Cole does and builds into his games because it just makes me think so much differently. If you're a thinker, I'm sure you appreciate that as well. Mm. Um, it is just, yeah, it's it's always intriguing to see what he's going to come up with next. Ironically for me, the thing that's driving it up further is just, I'm, I we didn't get to play it with a campaign. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm actually really intrigued as to like what you know, what are the connectors? I know there's like there's meant to be a lot of different cards that then actually add into that story. Mm -hmm. So I'd be very curious to, to check that out. Yeah. yeah, and so in terms of the different backing levels, $60 for the base game, um, which is what we previewed, mm -hmm. um, versus $100 if you want to build in the campaign. Um, for us, that would probably be the level because then it would satisfy both of our um, mm -hmm. thinker thema traits. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can go in at $150 to bring miniatures into the game. And I just wanted to say, I don't think this game needs miniatures personally if mm. you love the miniatures or the the actual molds um of course mm. um, grab them but um for me i love the wooden pieces and mm. it's very reminiscent of leader games for me like it, yeah. it makes me think of all of those other games like oath and root and like all of the little wooden characters yeah so. i was gonna say that like I, I like the the detail of the plastic minis but i agree i actually would prefer the wooden minis yeah and i like the, of them. the the shapes are actually quite unusual in this game mm. like the little ships and everything yeah. um are quite detailed so um i like the wooden components yeah. um but go and check that out um a game that we both thoroughly enjoyed number two arcs and our number one game of the fortnight this week uh you probably could have guessed it it is the deluxe edition of the castles of burgundy mm. now the castles of burgundy is a fairly old game but a very well loved game uh by stefan feld and this game um, has had a couple of different editions. There was the original edition, then there was the anniversary edition, which polarized people in terms of which art style is better. Do we like the more saturated colors of the anniversary?
anniversary edition. We own the anniversary edition. Mm -hmm. Um, This is a game that we both really enjoy. It is a tile drafting, tile laying game, um, and also using... um, dice as workers essentially to Mm. so you are all simultaneously rolling dice and then you are going to be able to choose what you want to get done in the game Um, and that is a choice between drafting new tiles that are going to have different terrain on them and have different abilities that then go into your duchy area which you are going to place in um, kind of patterns that also require you to have the right die value to Mm. place it there And so this game is all about the tension of when to use which die for which action. Mm. And you are going to be able to manipulate those die by getting workers um, that can help, uh, obviously, uh, put the values up or down. Um, But you can only get those when you kind of discard a die. So it Mm. makes it a very interesting tension between when you're building up for later rounds. The other part of the puzzle that's so cool is that when you complete an area of terrain, you're going to score um, points, but those points are going to be declining over the course of the game. So the quicker you can finish off whole areas of your board, the better. Mm. Now, a lot of people would call this their ultimate game ever. Mm. Um, People love number one game. Love this game. Um, However, most people agree that the aesthetics and the production quality of the game is not ideal, Um, Mm. especially in the way that you need to replenish the tiles. That Mm. is quite difficult because if you haven't um, upgraded your own copy by adding um, bags Mm. into the mix, it's a bit annoying because you've got to turn all, you've got to set up all the tiles face down. Face down tiles. And then you've got to, yeah, as you reveal them, the tiles are quite small, which can be a bit fiddly Mm. and annoying. And then the player boards, of course, um, are quite thin and anyway the deluxe edition is fixing all that so cast all your problems aside now you only have a financial choice of whether you want to go all in on this deluxe edition um in this edition we're introducing uh these wonderful dual layered boards that Mm. actually have an acrylic cover on them that you can lift up and change out the duchy board. Mm. Um, but that means when you put it back down again, you can have any configuration that's going to sit nicely mm. in this and create nice little spaces for your mm. tiles to click into. So I first, Satisfying. first yeah. and foremost, I would have to say that's probably one of the best upgrades mm-hmm. that people will be looking forward to. Now, the tiles themselves, there's also um, an option to have those as acrylic. Mm. And if I've learned anything about backing the premium chips in Wonderland's War, it's that get the premium, Mm. get the premium option for the thing that you're going to be touching the most in the game. Because that the tiles that this whole game is about the tiles yeah, yeah. and so how satisfying is it going to be taking those tiles and clicking them into place i really i really am looking forward to mm. that um but there are also additional things being brought into this game there is a new expansion that's been designed by stefan feld which is um like a side vineyard and that is going to connect next to your player board and it is a quadruple layered board mm. that looks like the rolling hills of yeah, a vineyard that's cool All the, yeah the, the gradient of the levels going up yeah. yeah and it also introduces these new tiles that are two hexes connected together that have grapes on them and you're going to be able to draft those from this very cool um up Upright vineyard that doesn't really need to be upright, but how cool does but it why look? Not? Um, you'll be able to draft those double tiles. The interesting thing about it is, of course, when you draft these tiles, they take up more room in your little holding area for mm. your tiles. So that's going to be an interesting additional dynamic, I think. Um, in this deluxe edition, it also includes all of the expansions that were originally available for the game. They've made some slight modifications to balance out some mm. things, I believe. Um, but for the most part, you'll be able to pick up the trading route and all of the different duchies that were originally produced um, for the game. Mm. But wait, there's more. There are minis, so actual Mm. miniatures that you can get that uh, form the castle in the center of your board, uh, which is quite 
deluxified, unnecessary, mm. yeah. um, but beautiful. And um, of course, now the tiles come in bags, thank mm-hmm. goodness. So, good. And there's going to be deluxe um, trays as well to help with setup. Yeah. So um, obviously, if you are a fan of this game, this is giving you more and more and more of the same thing without changing the underlying gameplay very much. In fact, it's very faithfully done, yeah. I think, this new edition. Yeah. Um, for us, mm. now... We do we do really enjoy Castles of Burgundy. Yes. I, it's a little bit on the abstract side for me, so I'm is. not going to say like, oh my goodness. So I, yeah, it, but, it's definitely not I our favourite game, yeah, yeah. but we do enjoy it when we play it. And yeah. the more we play it generally, the more we want to play it. I really enjoy the mobile app. I think it's a great mm-hmm. app. It's super relaxing. You've got all the like background sound <laughs> and I just really enjoy it. And, yeah. and because the original game was a bit annoying to set up, I tend to play that if Mm. I want to play this game yeah um but having said that I am so drawn in by the core components of this game I really like the idea of being able to get it to the table easier and having it would do that yeah but also at having more of an exciting table presence because 100% yeah it's the game is better than it the look of it yeah. Like right now, my, our friends would just be like, oh, especially because we introduced them to all these wonderful yeah. deluxe games. And yeah, then it's yeah. like, oh, this t- it's a high the, bar the board's now. very small. Yeah. Um, and the tiles are 30% bigger as well. I didn't say that, but mm. um, I would really appreciate that because it's hard for me to see sometimes what type of, the, <laughs> what type of buildings they are. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I'm kind of at the moment really excited about this, but on the fence about... Uh, what level to back it out. What I don't need is I don't feel like I need all of the boards, like Mm -hmm. all of the duchies, all of the bits and pieces to create variability in the game that's yeah. the kind of stuff that just sits in the big box yeah, not being used up playing like a million and one little expansions yeah. but yeah. i could see that if this is your favorite yeah, game exactly. then yeah. you're absolutely going to be uh, mm. living for those things so i don't want to take away from that but what level am i going to back it at there are many different levels here i think it is uh 90 95 euro to go gameplay all in mm. um but what's interesting about that is you can also drop the the minis and then it goes down to 85 euro I think because of that small difference, I would just get the miniature version because it's going to add to the table presence, which mm. I love. Or you can get then get um, an all-in version that is $142. It comes with the acrylic tiles. It mm. also comes with um, sun drop mini. So that's that pre-rinse kind of um, option mm-hmm. and a neoprene mat. Now, the neoprene mat I am torn on and I would love to hear in the comments what you think about the neoprene mat. For me, I feel as though does it need it? Mm. I, I think on one hand, it might help pick up the tiles a, a little bit easier because mm-hmm. it's always nicer to pick it up off a mat than it is off a board. Yeah. But I'm a little concerned that the the player boards are cardboard. And so for consistency, do I just want everything to be cardboard in terms of the boards mm-hmm. rather than having neoprene? And, I don't know. That is a... Yeah conundrum uh, what a conundrum yeah. we have here um so i did look into you know you could get it for 128 euro total if you just added the acrylic tiles and that's a non-negotiable for me i think i would mm. definitely be getting um the tiles but you know mm. i'll probably ultimately go all in um but for now I, I would say we are backing this i just haven't decided at what level um but if you are interested go and check it out it's not cheap but it's very very deluxe it <laughs> is the castles of burgundy our number one Now, if you've reached the end of the video, um, please, of course, like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It doesn't take very long to just go and click the like and it really does help us and provides us with feedback and lets us know that you enjoyed this video. Uh, One thing I would like to add here is I would love to hear as well this week in the comments. We obviously we promote a lot of games here. Sometimes it gets a little lost that we are, you know, putting in all this work to kind Mm -hmm. of highlight these campaigns. If um, something that we've said has driven you to the page um, to go and check out the campaign and you end up backing it, please mention where you saw um, the coverage uh, Mm. in the comments on the campaign. It just really helps the um, publishers to see and um, understand where that is being driven from. Mm. And then it helps us get in contact with more publishers as well. So Mm. I'd really appreciate if you could do that. We'll have to think of some like cool hashtag Mm. to add to that or something. (laughs) Like I think our themer made me do it. Hopefully we didn't make you do it. No. <laughs> think your theme uh, alerted me to it. I, I don't know. We'll- yeah, not fiscally unresponsible. That doesn't seem right. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe like TT. TT sent me. 
Yeah. And then they'll be like, what is that? And what how is, do I look that yeah, up? Yeah, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Probably going to create more confusion. Though. Much more yeah. confusion. But anyway, um, we appreciate you watching as always. Hope you enjoyed this video. We'll be back with more board game reviews soon. But otherwise, have a great week and bye for now. Bye.